To offer a brief background on Norse tipping, since many outside of Norway won't be familiar with it, it's the Norwegian National Lottery. They have traditional lottery draws, instant gaming, and betting. It started in 1948 as a way to channel profits from gaming to the Norwegian sport and cultural sector. It's really important and in 2019 generated 5.7 billion krona profit, or about 15 million a day, that supports good causes. In general, there were emerging questions about the relationship between social responsibility initiatives and linking those to proceeds from gaming. Now, this is something that was beginning to be discussed in a number of forums and created questions about the ethics of using gaming to benefit society. The whistleblowing case focused on a few issues of corruption, including inappropriate expenditure of funds. For example, the organization's head was known to take expensive executive excursions with external stakeholders as a way of building partnerships. Now, that would be less of an issue in a private corporation, but in a publicly owned one, it's inappropriate. Additionally, there's a disproportionate amount of funds distributed to the local community where the organization was centered. Put together, it pointed to, in a best case scenario, a mismanagement of public funds, and in the worst, a deep corruption by an organization's leadership. Imagine yourself as the person who's responsible for an organization's messaging, trying to ensure that organization's meeting its social responsibility objectives, trying to work within the organization to affect change for years, but then finally blowing the whistle and being asked to return to your role undercover while the full investigation was conducted, like nothing was wrong, for two years. This was the position that Pear found himself in at Norse Tipping. Pear is now an academic and agreed to share his story in a new book, Whistleblowing Communication and Consequences, edited by Larry Browning, Jan Sorens, and Pear. The book is based on several days of interviews conducted by Larry and Jan with Pear, and then was analyzed by academics from around the world. I was asked to write a chapter in the book on the crisis communication take on it. In the book, my chapter, and across the chapters, you get a sense of Pear sharing his experience. It's well worth the read for communication, PR, management, and media professionals. There's certainly a lesson in ethical behavior and choices and unfortunately, some of the consequences and stress that comes along with that. Imagine after two years of being undercover and then being outed as the whistleblower by the media, that this is what you were told by your organization, even by the same person who was just before singing your praises as the whistleblower. As I mentioned, we rarely get a first-hand look into a whistleblower's experience. Certainly, we've seen narratives and movies about whistleblowing, but we often see the most sensationalized versions of these experiences. From a crisis perspective, this case serves six functions. First, it demonstrates the complexity of a crisis. Norse Tipping was made aware of the accusations against it, and especially the management before the crisis broke in the media. An air of suspicion emerged within, and what had been a fairly open and positive work environment, well, there were tensions and speculations that grew within the workplace that Pear had to deflect. As the issue emerged in the media, the speculation and number of interested stakeholders only grew. Second, the case demonstrates the unique elements of whistleblowing. As I mentioned in the Chapter 13 podcast, whistleblowing represents a fundamental breakdown in the relationship between an employee and his or her organization, and if not the organization, then the leadership within the organization. The fact of the matter can be that the employee genuinely still feels connected to the organization and trying to do the right thing to ensure that the organization performs better. This was the case with Pear. He still felt a strong connection to Norse tipping. We have to remember that whistleblowing isn't about getting even with an organization. It's often a very long process where the whistleblower has unsuccessfully tried to point out critical risks and issues within the organization structure, but where those concerns have been ignored and disregarded. Whistleblowing represents a complex and challenging decision that involves a range of emotions from the whistleblower like guilt, anger, frustration, 
and sadness and where the whistleblower is putting their personal relationships with his or her colleagues at risk. One of the arguments that I make with the stakeholder relationship management theory is that the relationships between organizations and their stakeholders are highly fluid. Whistleblowing demonstrates this point very well. Pear described going to work for Norse Tipping as a job that excited him because he wanted to do work that was connected with social responsibility and community support. He also had very strong and positive relationships with his colleagues and with the organization's leadership. But as the issues of corruption emerged, not surprisingly, his relationship with the organization and people in it began to break down as well. Materially, in the case of Norse Tipping, blame attribution simple. The organization's leader was at fault for inappropriate spending practices. However, the objective blame didn't matter as much. Pear was held accountable and experienced blame himself because blowing the whistle shined a light on the disproportionate spending in the local community that Norse Tipping was housed in compared to the rest of Norway. And that was not favorably received by the local community. So he was also certainly blamed within the organization by the leader and ultimately became a bit of a liability. Yet, of course, there are groups who celebrated Pear's actions. So who was material at fault was certainly of interest to the regulators. However, from a blame attribution perspective, the case really demonstrates that blame is in the eye of the beholder and what interest they have in both the situation and the actors. In a 2020 context, ask people from around the world who's to blame for COVID, and there's a range of answers that look outwardly and within countries. Why? because how people attribute blame in a crisis isn't cut and dry. A simple case of an organizational transgression like the Norse Tipping case demonstrates that. But then add in the complex pandemic like COVID has been, and we start to see the policy and behavioral implications of blame attribution. So this case demonstrates that we have to look at blame attribution in terms of different perceptions of it, rather than just as a simple question of fact. Fifth, the different attitudes towards pair nurse tipping in the crisis demonstrates that different stakeholders will have vastly different interests in a crisis. For example, public sentiment towards pair in the small town where nurse tipping was headquartered was very negative. It was even recommended that he literally leave town before the story broke that he was the whistleblower. However, in Oslo, public sentiment was very positive. He was seen as someone who supported broad cultural values and ethics. Why the difference? different material and emotional stakes in the situation, and certainly different levels of threat perception. In Oslo, it's likely that the threat of corruption in a public organization was the critical threat perceived by the case. However, in the local community, since it had benefited from the proceeds, there are a number of different types of threat from the community's reputation all the way to self-interest of protecting programs in that community. Finally, looking at a case like this also forces us to think more directly about the employee experience in crises. This is something that is widely acknowledged in the crisis literature as being an area of study that critically needs development. When we turn to the lessons learned, initially Norse Tipping was going to be managing the inconvenient truths of their organization's key activities and its mission for social engagement and betterment. How an organization is viewed as it enters a crisis will also depend on public judgments over its overall ethics and mission. For an organization operating in a complex environment with potentially contradictory missions, they will have to manage their work and their behaviors very carefully. This is something that Norse Tipping didn't do. The reality of the fishing junkets and the disproportionate allocation of resources may not have created such a crisis for the organization if it were for profit, However, the public nature of it, combined with the work that it did, created different kinds of pressures and risk on its performance. A second lesson learned from this case is in terms of stakeholder relationship management. Clearly, there was a disconnect between Norse Tippin's behaviors and its stakeholders' expectations. Fishing junkets, uneven distribution of resources to support the local community versus the rest of Norway, and the ethics of responsible gaming all created the conditions that frustrated stakeholders to create this disconnection and the frustration in managing that stakeholder relationship.
A third lesson learned is that quite frankly, Norse tipping missed opportunities to manage issues and avoid the crisis. This makes the point that many crises themselves are simply avoidable. Whistleblowing is not the first alternative. If we think about Pear's journey, he spent time trying to work within the organization, making recommendations and, and trying to improve the organization's overall responsiveness and social responsibility. So he was working to create the conditions for an ethical and effective organization, but that was simply pushed backwards. Norse tipping failed to meet expectations, but it wasn't without warning. It wasn't without effort to try and change that, but the organization itself failed to see those opportunities. This is an important lesson in terms of issues management and identifying and listening to employees when they bring potential issues forward. Overall, this case is interesting because it demonstrates a number of factors. First is the dual nature of crises, where there is a primary crisis and a secondary crisis, and this produces a really complicated notion of blame attribution. So we noted earlier that Norse tipping committed the transgression. That part of the blame attribution was cut and dry and simple. But the whistleblower themselves is really the hidden enemy because of the betrayal or the perceived betrayal of leaders and colleagues, the criticism in the media for not taking command, pairs ultimately not being trusted by those who, who actually asked him to stay on within the organization. And it also shows disconnection sometimes between local and national communities. So the duality of crises can come in multiple forms. And, and in a lot of complicating factors. So the whistleblower experience demonstrates not only how an individual crisis can evolve and emerge, but also how sometimes the attributions and the judgments may not be fair.